Okay, we are live. Thanks all for coming. Uh, my name is Jonas Bonier. I'm uh, <clears throat> at uh, in real life, so to speak. I'm uh, CTO and co-founder of, of Lightband, former TypeSafe. I started the Akka project uh, a little, like almost, was it seven, eight years ago now. And um, I'm going to talk to you about here, try to explain sort of the essence of what it means to be event-driven. So how to think in terms of events and what they can enable us to do as developers in terms of architecture and the way we think about, about software in general. Uh, sort of an architectural sort of, um, yeah, journey, you, you can say. Um, so everyone is really talking about events, or not everyone, but it's really hyped, you know, buzzworthy now, event-driven is back again. It's, it's actually a quite old concept. I, 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 I've been using events for most of, our, of, my, of my life, you know, started using, you know, events when, it, when I was back in school about 20 years ago. It was, I, was, I was part of a, of a, uh, of a community uh, around the open source uh, window manager called KDE, and that was written in, in, a, in a widget library called Qt, that had this, this concept of signals and slots. That was really event-driven. And um, events sort of follow, follow, following me around, like, you know, in different phases. I mean, um, an SOA and, and, and this ESBs and OEJBs, especially message-driven beans, et cetera, et cetera. And now they're really hyped again. So why should you care? You know, we've been doing full circle again as an industry, as we always do. Hopefully we get a little bit better each time around. Uh, so... I think that I'll, I'll hope to try to con give, at least give you a glimpse, if not fully convinced, that events can help us with things like drive autonomy. Both autonomous teams, including autonomous components, help us to reduce risk and moving faster when we tr try to move, move from legacy to a more modern architecture. You know, it, it helps increase things like loose couplings, increase stability in the system, and increase scalability and resilience. Also, traceability. And, and uh, even allow things like, 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 like travel in time and, and take advantage of that. Having a stable notion of time in distributed systems, which is extremely important and way too often forgotten and, and ignored. And, uh, and another question that is sort of relevant is why now? Why is events you know, starting to become hype, hyped again? So let me turn this on. Well, I mean, I think it's four things. First, it's, first is the, this whole move for us as developers, you know, toward cloud and, 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 and uh, multi-core architectures that like fundamentally changed change the game. We have to move away from monolithic architecture, from, from, from just one single, you know, thread per request all the way down to the database and fully take advantage of multiple cores, multiple nodes, multiple you know, data centers, you know, virtualization is really pointing in that direction, et cetera. Also, this whole move toward microservices, scaling the organization, I mean, meeting time to market, et cetera, that forces us to, to you know, fully embrace the distributed systems. And we didn't have to do that earlier. We could, we could sort of cheat and, have to, and chose to, choose to ignore, you know, the university classes we took on distributed systems back in school. 10, 10, 15, 20 years ago. But guess what? I mean, now we need to go back and relearn those practices. They're actually extremely useful because we're thrown, thrown in again in this you know, vastly different world called distributed systems. Also, most systems today need to be data-centric. You know, applications that need to react to data as it arrives in close to real time and are often dominated by data. It's not just something we can like, shove down into a database and think of, it, think of it as data at rest. We need to you know, fully embrace it as data in motion. And, and, and the fourth is our customers. You know, they want more of everything, and they want it now. They want like lower latency and better throughput, like I mean, fa features faster, more features, more data, et cetera, et cetera. And they have learned to be very, very picky. And, and they can you know, very easily like, go over to a competitor if we don't you know, live up to, to their expectations. And so let's say that a, a company now wants to sort of modernize uh, sort of a legacy monolith here. And, and way too often, you know, customers and people, they settle with this. 
what, 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 what I call microliths, where you have like single instance services, which is sure good, but they, you know, but, but, but they are sort of still suffer from this strong coupling that, that synchronous protocols give them, give, give them in between. This often means that you need to, that you sort of need to up, sometimes update, update them in lockstep. And, and, and you can't in any way take advantage of that you're actually now building a di di distributed system and take advantage of, you know, cloud computing and pay as you go and scale, you know, and, the, and resilience also really, really, or I would say availability also very much suffers when, when you have strong coupling between, between components. As well as we we can't take advantage of of, of multi core architectures in the way we should if we if we block down to the database every single time etc. I think we can we we can do better than this. Sorry, I skipped my slide. And uh, I think event driven architectures can really help us here. The, the, the definition, according to Gartner, is that event-driven architectures is a design paradigm in which software component executes in response to receiving one or more event notifications. Event-driven architecture can really work as sort of an intermediary here, help us building these, these systems with fully decoupled autonomous components that can you know, act and behave fully autonomous and can also be you know, implemented and rolled out and, and upgraded in by autonomous teams in full sort of isolation of each other. So it's really, I think event-driven architecture can really be an enabler, I mean, that can help us sort of break down, you know, the chains of legacy software that is holding back the organization and can help us reduce risk in terms of modernizing our architecture, you know, by orders of magnitude. But let's start with the basics. What is an event? If you go to Merriam-Webster, it says that it's something that happens, right? It's not that helpful. So, uh, so my sort of little longer definition, we try to distill the essence of events, is that events represent facts of information. You know, knowledge can only grow. You, you can't you sort of retract knowledge. Knowledge just grows from we are born all the way up until we die. I mean, should dementia and other things can, can, can hit where we forget things, but in concept, knowledge is just an additive process. I mean, facts only accrue. Okay? So, so but, but events can, however, be disregarded. You, you can't choose to sort of ignore a fact saying, I mean, if, 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 you, if you think that there is a risk that the, that the, the other service or the, the one I'm talking to is lying or, or, or like he causes some sort of conflict in you, in you, I mean, one fact might be in, in violation with another fact, then we can choose to, to sort of ignore sort of certain facts. But it's, but it's important that once a fact has been accepted, it can't be retracted, okay? At least not con conceptually. And facts also cannot be deleted once accepted. This, of course, poses a problem in computer science. I mean, where sometimes facts have to be deleted for moral reasons or for actually even legal reasons. But I think conceptually we need to think about facts as something that can't be deleted, even though we sometimes have to do that for, for, for practical reasons. However, new facts arrive in arriving can invalidate you know, existing facts. That's how we, we as human works all the time. We learn more and we realize that we were wrong or that our information is, out, is, is outdated. Okay? And I think this is really the way I at least think about events and how they sort of arrive into a component and how I should act upon them. The core machinery in, 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 in events sort of is the event loop. It's really what makes events tick. Okay? And the event loop is really, is really sort, of b b sort of built up of two things. First, we have the queue. Arrive, um, so events that arrive ends up in this queue. And then we have sort of event loop that sort of picks, you know, picks one at a time. And for each one, sort of it invokes this callback. So we have this anonymous callbacks that are invoked for each event that is, that is, that is taken off the queue and, and, and processed. And this is very much, you know, according to the Hollywood principle, I'm sure you've heard about it. like don't call us, we call you type of approach. It's, or, it's, it's, it's important to understand that event loop by itself, a pure event loop has at most once delivery guarantees. If you want more delivery guarantees or more guarantees at all, 
you have to sort of rely on some sort of underlying fabric or, or some other mechanism to deal with, to deal with that. And so it's, it's also very important to understand that event loop is a local thing only. Pure, sort of, a pure event-driven approach is, 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 is just a local thing. You only sort of emit events to whoever's happened to listening locally. There's no concept of communication or, or, or addressing that I will talk more, more, more about later. Uh, events, event loop can, also, can, can sort of invoke these, to so pick the queue and invoke the callback in an asynchronous or in a synchronous fashion. Asynchronous usually is more flexible, more, more powerful, and often the norm, but, you, you, but it's, it's absolutely possible to do that in a fully syn synchronous handover type of fashion, where you often don't need the queue. You just do immediate ha ha handover. I'd say that it's, it's a quite limited, but it's also an important building block in terms of building these, these type of approach or these type of, of architectures. But it's absolutely not the, what we can sort of... Um, we need to build on top of it, I'd say. One of the problems with, 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 with event callbacks is that they are ephemeral and they are in, uh, anonymous. Okay? And, and that means that it's really hard to build a sane failure model around just callbacks. B because you know that we can't reference the failed callback. We can't reference the failed context because it's, it just vanishes. It executes and, and, and just dies. It doesn't have a concept of an address, of a reference. You know? This means that we can't manage the life cycle of, 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 of events. They just, you know, they are truly ephem ephemeral. And we can't restart the failed context, etc. The only thing we can do is really sort of rely on on, an, on some sort of error channel, like where we sort of like push failure downstream just before we die. Okay, so that's just a very limited and very, very, very sort of yeah, very limited approach to fa to, to failure management in general. It also doesn't give us any 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 form of, of composition since we can't compose things. And naturally, why we can't do that is that we have you know this the signature for 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 for, for callbacks is, is you know input to side effect. The, the, there's no re return type of it. It's just side effecting. And since there's no re re return type, we we can chain them as we can do with 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 functions. So there's really no way of sort of composing things in the same in the same fashion. And this all the, all this means that it's hard to, to debug, hard to reason about, and often leads to these things like we you know people make fun of it, the callback hell and the pyramid of doom and these and these type of things. And if you still embark on this journey, I mean, you might actually find yourself trapped in this mess. Well. Let it burn. What we need, I think, is high-level abstractions. And see the event loop and callbacks as a great building block to building more high-level abstractions that we can reason about semantically, that we can compose, etc. And 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 you know, the, the, these are no aliens to you, to you guys. I mean, we have patterns since many years, like like all the observer pattern, the the pub sub pattern, broadcast, and multicast, and these type of things, they build great on, on top of an event loop. Things like data flow variables might be sort of a little bit of obscure things, but, 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 like, but, but future and promises is starting to, to really hit mainstream now. We have them in most languages. Stream processing is really also f actually fully event-driven, but it gives us more high-level semantics how to work with these things, you know, with, with functional combinations, like filter group by map, and then you know fold and these type of things that that that, that um, like sort of remains the same across different different products etc. We can assume that they have sort of the same type of library of of of, of transformation functions today. I mean, from Spark to you know uh, Aka Streams to Oryx Java, whatever they're all they're all there, and that also helps you know with with cognitive burden of learning these new things over and over again. Event driven microservices can also be looked seen that as as, as sort of a high-level pattern on top of these of these ideas, including things like look, func function as a service and so on. So, but let, let, let's dive into sort of more high the high-level concept of event-driven services, and because you know services is what we all ultimately want to want to want to build microservices or whatever. So, event-driven services usually sort of receive or react to facts, you know, that is sort of coming its way, and. It, it, it does its work, and when it's ready to, 
to, uh, to like tell the world about you know, what it came up with, it publishes new facts to the world. You know, and, and facts are stable values. Im they are immutable. So that means that others that are listening in on these facts can sort of base their reasoning on stable facts, you know, things that won't change, that can't be retracted, and things like that. And, and I think also another important, might be subtle thing, is that this way of thinking sort of inverts the control flow. And, and this also it helps us sort of minimize coupling and also increase the, the autonomy of each component. I could dive, dive, in, into, into the, dive deeper into this now, but I don't think I have enough time. But what is really important here is that mutable state, you know, even though we talk about facts and immutability, you know, that's always good. I, mean, I think mutable states, it absolutely has its place, you know, but it needs to be contained within the service. It can't possibly leak. It needs to be fully non-observable to the rest of the world. So you accept a fact that's a mutable value. You can use mutable state to get your shit done. Sorry, get your things done. <laughs> and, and, and once you're ready to sort of, you know, tell the world about it, create a fact, create an immutable, stable value about it, representing that, and then publish that out to the world. Okay? Yeah, so, so that's essentially what I try to say. So, and how do you do that then? Yeah, I think the, the best way of doing that, that of course, there are of course many ways you can communicate facts, but one, one of the best ways is to use an event stream, some sort of, a, of, an, of an event stream, because that can really work, work as the general integration fabric between all of these components that are flying around. Okay? Uh, you know, so if, if, I, if, I, if I may try to illustrate then what I mean here by, by some animations here. Well, let's say you have some sort of user that sends a command to one of these services. A command can, you know, come in through, through the event stream, but it's mo probably more often used um, sort of sent to, so use, through using HTTP or in GR, gRPC or, or some, some sort of RPC type of mechanism coming from the client. Okay? And uh, it ends up in the component's ma mail mailbox and some action is, is performed. Okay? Out of that action, I now create an event that I sort of publish out to the event bus, the event stream. This event stream now can sort of just relay this event to whoever happened to be interested in that this, that I performed this action. That I actually did this, did, did, did this, this side effect. That can be, you know, other, other components here that has, you know, so it's, it's, it's put on their, on, their, on their mailboxes and some action is, is performed. So all that is natural. But what is also really, really, really great that this, that this event stream can also work as an integration fabric beyond just communicating between services. It can, re, it can like, be, like push things down into a third-party database. Or even for analysis, HDFS picked up by Spark Streaming or, some, or Flink or something for data processing or Hadoop, I mean, if you're old school. Or, 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 or like shove it over to some external system. Like, like sort of that's beyond of your, of, your, of, your, of, of your control. So I really think that it, it can be sort of this thing that tie the, you know, your whole story together, if used correctly. One important thing to understand, though, is that is that it's you know all the things that regards to events should really happen in a fully asynchronous fashion. That means that everything here is eventually consistent, which is you know is quite a leap to to make, but I absolutely think it's 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 worth it. I'll talk more about that later. So if you want an analogy, and like Big Lebowski, like I do, it's really sort of you can see the event stream, sort of the rug, sort of, sort of, sort of ties the room together. It might be a stretch, but it really helped me. Um, so no one really wants eventual consistency, though. I think it's really, it's, it's a fact of life that we have to embrace it, but it's a necessary evil. It, it will make your life a little bit more complicated, but, you know, it will give you things like better room, headroom for scalability and resilience and, and, and uh, autonomous components and, you know, etc. It's really how the world works. All the time. If you just th if you just think about it, I mean, there's no thing, no such thing as as one single globally cons consistent truth at all times. No, it's not. We're not. You know, everyone in this room is not fully consistent. Doesn't experience exactly the same experience all the time. That's how we communicate and negotiate, and you know, and get. But we I mean, we're getting along quite well anyway. 
you know, one important thing to understand is information travels at the speed, at the speed of light. That really puts a, a limit on the speed of information. And that's really a reality in, in, in the system to today, a hard reality that needs to take into account. It means that information is always from the past. When we, when we observe something, it has all, always already happened, sometimes actually quite some, quite some time ago. So we're sort of always sort of looking into the eye of the beholder. No, sorry, we're always looking into the past, I mean. So, so it's always, it's, what we experience is always in the, eye, in the eye of the beholder. So the present and the now is relative. Everything is really ev ev eventually consistent. And when we sort of, en sort of exit this sort of safe zone of, 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 of our components, we really sort of enter a wild ocean of non-determinism. That's the sort of the, the world of, of distributed systems. And distributed systems are hard, you know. It's, it's the world where systems like fail in the most spectacular ways, where messages are dropped, reordered, where failure detection is nothing but a guessing game. But it's also the world that gives us, you know, solutions for things like resilience and scalability and autonomy and all these things. Uh, but I think to, to stay sane in this world, we need to have a way to model uncer un 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 uncertainty. You know, Pat pa pa once said that in a system which cannot count on distributed transactions, the management of this uncertainty must be implemented in the business logic. So I really, I really, we need, we need to have sort of a way of modeling the space between the services, not just, you know, thing within, within the service. Not try to hide it, but making it explicit. So when we talk about actor programming and distributed systems in general, I usually try to teach that we should sort of embrace the network, making, making the constraints of the network part of the programming model, instead of trying to hide it like we do, have sort of been learned to do, you know, historically through RPC or distributed objects and, you know, pretend it's not there, then, it, then, then we should be fine. No, no, it's the opposite. Then it will definitely come back and bite you. So we need a way to exploit reality in our design and use it at our advantage. Just look around and model the world as it actually is, instead of you know tr try to like you know create some sort of, of of shielded you know simplified world in in our in, in in our computer systems. And I really believe that events can lead to greater certainty. Really, it can help us model this uncertainty. That, that I'm talking about, because events can help us to craft these autonomous islands of, of determinism, where we are in control of now, and where we are, where, where actually we can rely on things being fully deterministic. So, I mean, once we sort of submit this event outside this context or receive something, the space in between them might be totally indeterministic. The events might be reordered or dropped or whatever. But if we have, we can at least, you know, account for and, and sort of trust that when the event arrives or when the command arrives into our, our component, we can, re we can relax, which is, which is quite good. And, and one thing that, will, that, will, that helped me a lot with this, and I, I think it will help you as well, is, is what is starting to be called events-first domain-driven design. You know, domain-driven design has been around for quite a long time. It was started, you know, by... Or, coined by Eric Evans in 2003 or something. It was a long time, 15 years ago or something. And it's really ser served us well, but it can actually lead us down you know, the wrong path if you just apply it blindly according to the, to the, to the, to the book, because it often fo it puts focus on domain objects and structure too early in the, in the design process. I mean, I usually try to practice what I call events-first domain-driven design, where we actually put focus on what's happening in the system first. Greg Young once said that when you start modeling events, it forces you to think about the behavior of the system as, to, as opposed to thinking about the structure of the system. Okay? So we should, we should don't focus on the things initially. We should don't focus on the nuns the domain objects that we've been taught to think about first. We should instead focus on what happens, okay? The verbs, search the verbs in the model, and that will be the events, okay? We should sort of mind the facts, coming in, but th think, think about yourself like, like, you know, CSI coming into a crime scene, or Sherlock Holmes or whatever, coming into a crime scene and say, ask, what are the facts? You know, you should try to mind the facts. 
and understand causality. I mean, what, le- what have led to the next thing and to the next thing? And one thing that can help us here is, is the concept called event storming. It's essentially a technique where you put all the stakeholders, programmers, domain experts in one single room, you hand them, you hand them a bunch of post-it notes and, say, and, and let them sort of explore and mine, you know, what's, ha- I mean, what's really been going on in the system. What are the events? What have caused the events? Often the commands, etc. And try to like, map all that out, looking, looking at it from a perspective of what's happening, the verbs. Okay? So we should try to sort of understand, we should try to, well, so when we do that, we should try to understand first intents. That, that is things like communication, conversation, expectation, contracts, transfer of control, and also facts, things like state, history, causality, notifications, transfer of state. And intents are usually mapped to commands, while facts very often are mapped to events. Take it with a grain of salt. It's just some, try to give you some guidance how you think about mining your model and coming up with, with a, something sensible. Okay. So commands, you know, are usually so an object form of a method, of some sort of action request. It, it's usually sort of phrased in the, in, the, in the imperative, like create order, shape product, or something like that. That sort of leads to some sort of reaction. That is a side effect that is created. And that side effect means sort of after, after you've done the side effect, you create an event that represents that that side effect had happened. Okay? That's usually sort of phrased in the in past tense like order created instead of create order, you know, product ship instead of ship product, so on. But let's, let's dig a little bit deeper. Then commands is really all about intent, while events are f- fully intentless. They just you know, represent something that has happened. But commands are directed while events are anonymous, okay? Commands have a single addressable destination. While events, they just happen for anyone to observe. It can be zero, it can be 10, it can be 100. It doesn't matter. This means a commands model personal one-to-one communication, while events sort of models broadcast. You know, I think speakers corner where you'll shout out your views with a megaphone. You know, so hopefully someone's listening to you. And commands then have a distributed focus because they are address they they they, they model communication. You know, communication sort of tr- you know tr- tr- so you moves across contexts. While events, as I've said before, has a local focus, it doesn't cross contexts. And so commands are really all about command and control. I tell you what to do, you better do it. While events is fully about autonomy. I react to whatever happens my way, and I choose if I should do something or not. I could choose to ignore. So that's why I think, I mean, the, this tension between events and commands is extremely important. And I think we should let events then sort of define the bounded context, define the protocols, you know, and the promises that we, that we, that we, that, that we can make, and what happens also when we, when we decide not, that we can't sort of keep them any longer. Uh, <clears throat> in, mo- in DDD, you know, we, you usually model this in terms of the aggregate. The aggregate, you know, is... Is, 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 is the component that manages state, usually mapped to some sort of database for, for durable storage. It is your, your unit of, of, of consistency that manages the integrity of your data and the consistency of the data, ideally in a strongly consistent fashion per aggregate, you know, so you can rely on full de- determinism within the, within the aggregate. It's also a unit of failure. If an aggregate fails, it needs to fail as one thing, you, you, you can't shard an aggregate. That means that you have partial failures. Okay? So, and it also is replicated as a whole. It's started up as a whole. It, it's always atomic, in a way. And this means that it can be fully autonomous. Okay? But I know what you guys are thinking. Enough talk. Show me the code. So I actually tried to do that. I'm freaking out. But uh, let, let's, let's try to dive into some code. What I'm going to try to do is, is, is sort of show you uh, this, essentially this, this use case. We have the client that is, yeah, probably some, some going to come from a web browser or something like that. You could, I mean, pushing in a, an order into an orders 
so sort of process manager, orchestrator, that's orchestrates you know, the order in, the, in behalf of, of the client. Talking to the inventory by sort of trying to reserve products, uh, if that's... Uh, if it's possible to reserve them, submits a payment, the payment is approved, ship the products. If products are shipped, it sends a confirmation back to, the, back to the client. So that is the idea. So we have one client and three different sort of services. <clears throat> and the inventory and payments, then, then they, are, they should probably be modeled as, as, en as, as entities because they sort of represent this sort of unit of consistency for each one of these sort of services. Okay. So let's now try to do that. Uh, so I have IntelliJ here open. Um, okay, so I, I just I just open up a fresh file, order management dot Java here. So let's say we we want to have some scaffolding here. I'm just gonna I'm gonna gonna code this app in 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 Akka. Akka is a great uh, you know distribution fabric. Uh, it's, it's a sort of a, a tool toolbox for building di distributed systems, for building microservices type of, of applications, etc. I won't have time to dive into details, but I'm going to use it because I think it, will, it was a, it's a great practical way of highlighting some of the ideas I've had, uh, I've given you here. So let's say that we want to sort of create some some commands here first. We have some sort of interface command. We have create create order with some properties. We have reserve product, submit payment, and then ship product. If, of course, I mean, in the, in the real life scenario, I would never use serializable. I'd probably serialize it to JSON or use an Avro or Protobuf or something like that. But I'm just trying to keep it dead simple. This is by no means production code all, all throughout. Okay? Just trying to illustrate a point here. And then we create some, some events here. I mean, we have some sort of event interface here. We have product reserve, the sort of map, you know, reserve product if that was a successful a payment authorized, product shipped, and order completed. Okay, so let's now create a, f a few of these services then, starting with the, in with the inventory. We have an inventory actor here. I can, I can first just explain I mean, how many people have heard of the actor model, by the way, and knows what it's all about. Okay, most people here, but for you that doesn't, let's give you like a one minute recap of what an actor is. Actor is sort of distributed, fully autonomous, sort of service, you, you can say. It, it lives in isolation, it's, it's fully thread safe, it's location transparent, that means that the runtime can sort of move it around in the, in the, in the cluster as it to, as to optimize you know, the, how, how the actor is being used, etc. Each actor has, has a mailbox, sort of a message queue, so, so you can send a message to an actor regardless of where it happens to be in the cluster at this point, it will end up on his queue, and then an actor is multiplexed on a thread pool. So, so, so you, an actor is extremely lightweight, so you can have millions of, like, actually tens of millions of actors running on a single laptop because they only consume memory. They don't consume threads unless they run on the thread. Okay? So, so when, it's, when, it, when it's an actor's turn to, to, to sort of do his work, one message is, put, is taken from the mailbox in order, of course, from the queue, and it's put into the actor and into what is called the receive method of the actor. Okay? So, yeah, and actors that are fully resilient, you, know, you supervise the hierarchies to monitor each other, they can be restarted on failure and all these things. But I'll, I'll leave that for, as an exercise if you want to look, look, look into it. Okay, so we have the inventory, we have the payment actor, and then we have the order, or sorry, the orders actor. And uh, let's say now that we want to, we implement, first want to implement some logic for the inventory, so. So, we... And we, so this, this inventory logic is just, for, for, first we have just some, you know, some state, just to, to make it a little bit more interesting. As, as, you know, that in, 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 sort of in, 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 in Spring or in JE app, you probably map this down through JPA to some sort of database. But, but, he, but here we're just keeping it sort of in memory for now. Uh, and we, we, we have reserve, reserve products. The sort of essentially do some side effect. They're now rep represented, just printing it out. But in the in the re in the real world, of course, we actually perform the action of reserving the product. If that is successful, then it sort of returns product reserved. Okay. We have ship the ship product method that the, essentially just you know updates increments the number of ship products, and then if everything successfully just returns product shipped command. Okay. Uh, this is just internal logic. Now, what we want to do is that we want to 
we want to implement this receive method. Okay, so what's 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 happening here if uh, sort of a command of the type reserve product is sort of enters my queue, then it's put into the actor, and it and if 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 there is a match here, I will then run this this little f function here or lambda. Okay. I, I get the command as a, as a essentially this command then as as a as a as an argument to the lambda, and what I do is I, just, I simply call this reserve product. If things go well, which they always do in this case, uh, you know I, I get the event, and here and, and here comes the interesting things. You know now did this represent the fact that I have already reserved my product? That can't be taken back. You know it's probably enter some subsystem something. Then then I. Then I use Akka's internal event stream here. I'm getting a reference to that, and I'm simply publishing my, my product status downstream for whoever happened to be interested. In a real life scenario, I would probably not use Akka's event stream. That's sort of just used for simple communication between actors. Uh, I would probably use something like Kafka or Kinesis if I run on EC2 or, EC or, or, or so, but it, it serves a purpose for this, for this demo. You know, same thing here with the ship. If I if I get the ship product command coming in around this lambda, I, I'm, I'm trying to ship the product. I'm, I'm getting the shipping status event, and I'm pushing it downstream, essentially. Okay, for the payment service, I'm, 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 it's, it's like similar. I have some state here. In this case, the unique transaction ID that I increment each time I'm processing a payment. If things go well, I return the payment authorized method. No, oh, sorry, event. And uh, I run. I I have this receive block. You know, it's actually you know the receive is created by the receive builder. That's where, so it's actually returned here. But if if I if 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 I have a match for the submit payment command here, I, I process the payment, and if things are well, you know, then I get the event back and I publish it downstream. Okay. But the more interesting here now is that in the, the, the orders here, because you see the orders actually is sort of the orchestrator of all this whole transaction. It has you know, references to the client, to the inventory, and, and, the, and, the, and the payment. So what I want to do here now is I want to have it subscribe to these events. Orders, orders. Uh, and I do that in a method called pre-start. Pre-start is sort of called right before the actor is handed over to, to, do, to do work. Right before start is invoked on the actor, and what I do here is I get I get I get a reference to the event stream. I say subscribe. I'm subscribing that I myself should get the, the notifications. Here I'm actually sending in myself reference, and I say I'm interested in the product or serve, product shipped, and payment authorized uh, events. So whenever these are, are are like flowing down down downstream in the event stream, they are sent to me. Okay, so then I better have a way of or managing them as well, and I do that, of course. Oops, in the uh, in the in the receive receive block here. So uh, where where you can see that if I if 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 I get a create order class, uh, so create order command here coming from the client usually, then I essentially tell the inventory. Tell is actually the method on which I sent a fully asynchronous message to an actor. It looks like a synchronous call, but it, it's, it returns void and it sends it asynchronously to the actor. And, and, uh, and, and uh, so actors are location transparent, so regardless where this actor, the inventory actually resides at this point, can be another data center even. Uh, uh, it will it will get the message you know put on this queue etc. So I I'm so I'm so I'm 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 sending the reserve product uh, sort of command down to the inventory. If everything goes well, I get a product reserved event back. Then I can sort of tell you know tell the payment to su to, to to submit the payment. This is by the way of course not you know done sort of synchronously. These are these these are just callbacks as as I talked about that are invoked when one of these events or commands are coming in. This is sort of, this is sort of a de de declarative description of what to do when I receive events and commands. If the payment authorized, is authorized, I get the payment authorized event here and tell the inventory to ship the product. If the product is successfully shipped, then I can tell the client an order has been completed, etc. So this is, this is a great example of what is called a process manager. That's also something talked about you know, in, the D, in the DDD community. But it's a fully asynchronous type of, of process manager. 
Okay, so, so, so now I just want to have some, some sort of scaffolding code to run this. I have an order management you know, simulation here. The first thing I do is I just, all these actors, I always create an actor system. Okay, and then I, I, I have, uh, you know, I have some, some uh, first I just have some, some plumbing here. This is essentially just testing code for, for simulating to have a, an, an actor client. I have a client inbox that sort of events, so if, if someone replies to, 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 to this client inbox, they will end up in this inbox and I get an actor F. So this is sort of plumbing code that we can almost, almost forget. But here is, here's the, the interesting piece. I create a bunch of services here by, by using the actor of Sort of, sort of builder method, so sort of factory method here. I'm passing in sort of some conf configuration. Say I want to create an instance of the inventory actor, a payment actor, and the orders actor. I want to create the orders actor. I also want to pass in the other ones, you know, as, as, as arguments to the constructor. So here I have my all three actors. They are already started. And finally, you know, I, I, I say that I... I, I kick off the, the whole, you know, simulation by by sending a create order to the to the orders actor and say that everything that that a rep, if, if someone replies to me with that address, they will end up in my client inbox here. So I say I say that I, I I'm willing to wait five seconds here for for an order confirmation to come back. If that's okay, I'm just printing it out. If not, I get a timeout exception. Okay. So if I now run this whole thing. You can you can see that it's the simulation worked as as, as expected. The, com the 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 client sends sends a command to the orders, create order to the orders, then then the orders send a you know reserve product to the inventory, runs the side effect, event is produced you know representing the actual side effect, sent back to orders, that is the so the orchestrator, then 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 kicks things off with payment, back to orders, kicks things off with inventory, shipping things, and then back to the client eventually. Okay, so, so, he, so this is sort of an, extra, an example trying to illustrate how you can use the event stream and, and, and the concept of a process manager to orchestrate multiple, you know, fully, fully asynchronous event-driven components to doing their, their actual work. Let's see, I just want to go back to, to the slides here. So... So are we are we are are we done now then? Well, I think we we we've, we've come a long way here. But I but but it's also very important that events can also be used for 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 persistence and for managing time, which is which is quite amazing actually. I mean, some people stop here and they just say, I'm just going to persist all these services using CRUD down to the database and put it put it all in Cassandra or something. But I think that we sometimes sort of lose some of the power of of. Of events because the events, you know, they enter my system in the order they arrive. Why not just persist them in the order they are, they 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 arrive, you know, and let that be my my sort of my my durability. I mean, you know, all all SQL databases they do transaction logging under the hood. Then they only expose, you know, the you know a snapshot of now to us as developers to work with. That's our tables. You know, there's no history. Exposed to us as developer, etc. Event-based persistence can really can really help that. Uh, you know, I think event logging can really be sort of the bedrock if we allow ourselves to think about you know persistence in terms of traditional bookkeeping and and rely on on event logging. You know, store each event in the order as they as they arrive, durable on disk, just like transactions are done, like one by one in a ledger. And if we do that, I think it can really be the bedrock on which we build other things, more high-level concerns like consistency, like availability, scalability, and, and traceability, and so on. And event law, so event sourcing is really a great pattern that sits on top of the event log that gives us a tool for this. It can take advantage of our eventness, you know. Uh, in, you know event sourcing is really that we log each state change as an event. Each, each, each sort of... Each time we change the state in, in, an, in an event driven object, we log that as an event representing the fact that we did change the state. Okay? And, and this gives us a sort of strong, fully strong consistency in, in, the, in the object itself, sort of backed up by, by a transaction log. You know, you know Pat Hellman said the truth is it's in the log. The database is a cache of a subset of the log. You know, there used to be a reason why we used in-place updates. You know, disk space was used to be very, very expensive. 
But now it's immensely cheap. There's no, really no reason to keep all, not keep all history around at all that's ever happened in the system. You know, and, and, and so the question is, why work with the cache of a subset of the real thing when we can use, when we can work with the real thing, the log directly, and take advantage of the fact that we are event-driven. So event source services, you know, they, were, they, they work the way that if we, if we first, first look at the happy path, you know, we first receive and verify the command, for example, approve payment, then we create a new event, you know, payment approved, then we append that event to the event log. And then we update the internal component state if the logging was successful. And if that's successful, then we run the side effect, like launching nukes or whatever. Okay? Then the interesting comes thinks that when, when that component fails and is sort of rebooted up again, recovering from failure, then we sort of can rehydrate the events from the event log by, by just running that step and update the internal component state. And this is what Martin, Ta uh, Martin Fowler often calls her memory image. She allows us to sort of persist state in memory directly, you know, work with the state in this most natural representation in your, in your, in your object, instead of having to go through, you know, OR mapping and, and stuff like that. So this gives us really one sort of truth, all history, allow us to have this in-memory durable state of, 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 you know, of, of avoid this, or this, or this classic OR mapping impedance mismatch, where we have to map you know, our aerobic model or functional model to tables down into, into the SQL database. It also allows others to subscribe on changes that, that, that's happened, because people can sort of subscribe what's happening in the event log, you know, naturally. It also gives us like full traceability of what's happening in the system all the way up to where we are right now, because everything is there in the event log. We can replay the event log, not just from failure, but also to understand what went wrong, debuggability for audit. We have like bulletproof auditing right into the event log, for example. And it gives us great, what, what, what Martin Thompson called mechanical sympathy, because it really you know, works the way modern hardware works, with, with append only, single writer principle, writing you know, to disk in a fully append only fashion. You know, some disadvantage is, is that, you know, we have unfamiliar model, for example, where versioning of events can be, can, be, can be hard and deletion of events, I've already said, is hard, sometimes needed for legal reasons. Okay? So, I'm just going to, I'm running out of time a little bit, but I'm just going to try to show you in, in code how you can move this, let's see where we are. Move this, uh, sort of take this, this, this demo of ours and making it event source because the step of doing so now when we have the events really there, fully serializable, is almost nothing actually. Let's see if I can stop this. So, what, what we want to do here now is that we want to, you know, we, we want to take each one of these, these entities. We have the inventory entity and then the payment entity and make them event sourced. In ACA, we, the only thing we need to do really is we need to say that this should instead be a, persist, a persistent actor. And we also need some scaffold. We need to say this should have a persist, sorry, pers persistent ID. And we, give, we need to give, give it a name here, inventory. Okay? And same thing with this guy here, if we want to make that a per. No, I can't type persistent actor and a persistent ID and call it a payment. Okay. So, so the interesting thing is the only thing we need to do here is actually to invoke persist. So, you know, product status here represent the fact that, 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 that we do want to store. So I just, I'm just invoking the, 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 the persist command here saying I want to persist the, the, the product status uh, event. And if that is successful, then what I do is I, then I just, I don't want to run this, 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 uh, this, this, this callback. In this case, you know, pushing it downstream. The same thing with this one guy here. I just want to persist the shipping status command. And if everything goes well, I want to, I want to push it down to the to the event stream. Now, however, if things go go bad, the, the sort of the 
the unhappy path, the sad, the sad path. What I have to do then is that I have to, in, see, I need to implement this receive recover method that essentially says if Ray, for each time I reboot it, all these events that I persisted will be replayed. I need a way of managing them. Okay, so I have I so whenever again then get in the restart or, or reboot or, or recover scenarios, I get the, the the product reserve method here. I'm running this callback. In this case, I'm just printing it out. If I get a product shipped, I'm say I want to implement. I, I now want to increment the state again, bring the state back into in where it, where it was when I sort of started, uh, you know, from day from day one, and and uh, and then I'm just printing printing that out. And, this, and the same thing here for uh, persist uh, payment status. Bear with me, I'm almost done here. Uh, so I want to persist the payment status, and I also need to, sorry, uh, I still need to run the, uh, to implement the, the recover here. Saying that when, when, whenever I get a re replay then of the payment authorized, I'm going to now update my internal state, the transaction ID here, and I'm going to print it out. Okay, so this is really all I need to do. If I, if I now run the, this here, then you can see that the first time around, I'm not doing anything really, but the second, because I'm just logging things on, onto disk now, and then in this case, I'm just using level, level DB, which is the default persistence or log, but in, when I rerun it here, you can see that the events are actually replayed. I'm bringing, you know, my transaction number up to one and the product shape to one. If I rerun it again, you know, I'm, I should have, you know, I'm, I'm up to two, 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 two shape products, etc. So, so I really have fully re rehydrated the state in memory in my, in my components, all backed by, by the events that just been flowing into, the, into my components now, but now made durable to disk as they enter my components here. So that was essentially all I wanted to show you here. The key, the key takeaways, I really think that the event-driven design really helps us build fully autonomous services, you know, have them move faster to a reactive architecture, to take advantage of the promise of cloud computing, and, and distributed systems in general helps us reduce risk you know, moving to multiple teams and microservices, doing so by helping sort of balance certainty and uncertainty and event logging also, you know, allows us to take control over over the of the state, you know, of the history of the state itself. It allows us to do things like time travel, go back and replay on failure or auditing for debugging reasons. And even sometimes you actually, I mean, fork the the, the universes in into like separate, uh, um, you know, states for 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 different reasons. And allows us to manage, you know, this by doing strong, consistent, while being fully eventual consistent between the services. You have strongly consistent services, but eventual consistency in between, and making sort of sense of all that madness. So at least it, it, it's helped me a lot. I wrote a little book about this called Reactive Microsystems, which I'm actually going to going to hand out some right after this call, this talk, 420, I think, I mean, we'll be at the O'Reilly booth handing some of these out and signing them if you want. Else, else you can just download them, uh, the book at this URL here. So sorry for a little bit, being a little bit over time. That was all I had. I hope I, I, I made some sense and to put you on the path towards understanding and appreciating event-driven systems. So thanks.